Okay, hello everybody. My name is Kevin Hillman, as you can probably all read. I work for Lenaro. Um, I'm a kernel maintainer for some aspects of the kind of core power management pieces in the kernel. I'm also a maintainer or a, a co-maintainer of the ARM SOC parts of the Linux kernel. Um, so I'm mostly focused on ARM systems and, uh, and particularly embedded power management is kind of where my expertise is. Um, et pour les francophones, je parle un peu le français aussi. Donc si vous avez des questions plus tard, n'hésitez pas. But I will continue in English for now. <laughs> um, okay, so let's get going. And thank you for the invitation as well. It's great to be here. I, I live in Seattle. So I'm a long ways from home, so if I start to fall asleep, you know, I'm maybe boring myself, but it's also I'm a little bit uh, jet-lagged as well, so. Okay. So, um, and I have kind of an experimental uh, presentation style here too, so I'd appreciate any feedback on, on what you think of how the, how the presentation works uh, as a whole. So, um, so like I said, I work a lot with embedded SOCs and uh, where there's quite a bit of kind of uh, growing complexity in the hardware. So as a result, the kernel complexity is kind of having to evolve to, to uh, as it always does, have to deal with these new types of hardware. So they're packing more and more stuff into these SOCs, more, more CPUs, more types of CPUs, you know, GPUs, all sorts of I.O. devices. Um, and an interesting thing, another interesting development is um, what are called power domains or power islands where there's different ways of grouping different blocks together that can be power gated independently. Um, so the, I'm just going to kind of overview how the kernel's dealing with this complexity and how it's kind of evolved over the years. So these are all the kind of uh, topics I'm going to try to cover today, all the different pieces of the kernel power management. And kind of from kind of from bottom left over to the right is kind of how the kernel has evolved. So uh, for a long time, all we, all anybody cared about was suspend resume, kind of system wide suspend resume. And as hardware has gotten more complex, and the kernel has had to deal with complex hardware, it's evolved a whole bunch of different types of uh, power management features. So I'm going to kind of go through these, through these one by one, but starting with uh, starting with what we call static uh, power management. So static power management is kind of what most people think of when they think of uh, suspend resume, the traditional system-wide, um, what you use t typically on a laptop or something, or a, or a desktop where you just kind of suspend the entire thing altogether. Um, so this is, like I said, the entire system. It's all devices. It tend to be initiated by the user. Most often it's initiated by the user. Um, and any of the devices in the system, any of the drivers in the system can actually just say no and prevent the entire system from suspending. And uh, anybody that works on Linux on laptops has probably seen this a lot where the device just, your laptop just stops suspending or something. And a lot of times that's buggy drivers that just decide for whatever reason they, they just say no or their suspend method fails or something. Um, so that's part of the problem. There is it, anybody can prevent the entire system from going down. Um, and the entire user space, so all applications, all user space threads are frozen as well before any of the kernel stuff happens. Um, so yeah, so the entire system is done. Uh, and throughout the talk, I kind of reference a bunch of documentation from the kernel. The, the power management system has some uh, really good documentation in the kernel and some less so. Um, I kind of reference all of it, and I, sometimes I mention when it's really good or w whether it needs some work. But uh, so throughout the slides, you'll see some links to various parts of the kernel documentation as well. And please, inter as I go, please interrupt uh, or yell at me if I'm not looking. Um, if you have questions, we can go. Th we can talk whenever you want. So in the driver model. This is kind of a key structure that you've probably seen. If you've ever written a device driver, you've had to tinker with these things. So this dev PM ops is a really important uh, structure for the, the power, how the power management integrates into the driver model. So it's just a structure full of function pointers. Um, and this is part of every struct device driver. It's also part of all the bus types in the, in the kernel as well. Um, so we're going to kind of refer back to this as we go, but this is a, we'll refer to how to implement these various hooks as we go along. So this is, a, this is how you typically initiate a system-wide suspend, um, echo mem, syspower state, or there's, there's user space tools, of course, that do this for you, but when you're debugging this, this is a typical way of entering. 
So what I go over here is just kind of the various the various uh, hooks that are in your in the kernel code to actually implement this. So the left side set of functions is uh, kind of the the platform specific operations that happen, and on the right side there's those dev pm ops functions, and those happen for every every device driver. So your platform gets this begin callback. And then every single device driver in the system will get these prepare and suspend callbacks. Can you see the, is, you see the mouse moving around in there? That's uh, not the greatest pointer, but... Anyway, so on the left-hand side, these are kind of one-shot operations, platform-specific, that you can, as you're writing architecture support or platform-specific support, you can hook into these. And on the, left si on the right side, it's, it's drive, every device driver, every bus type gets these for every single device in the system. So it... Um, kind of platform specific operation and then it iterates through all the drivers through each of those callbacks. So as you, as you can see there's quite a few layers here. There's kind of get ready to suspend, then there's suspend, then there's suspend late, um, which is just an extra kind of extra layer for sometimes you have to order suspend resume, um, and then there's suspend no IRQ. This one is sometimes confusing to people. This doesn't actually mean that system interrupts are disabled. This means that device driver interrupts are disabled. So that's kind of a subtle difference. Sometimes driver writers don't always uh, know about. Um, and then finally, you get your platform gets an enter callback, which you actually could do your platform specific stuff to shut the platform off. And that's when the that's when finally the system is actually suspended. And then some wake up event happens, and you basically just reverse that whole process. So in order to wake up from suspend, um, there typically certain drivers in the system or devices in the system are configured to be wake up events, whether it's a, a, an Ethernet driver or a keyboard or serial port or something like that. But so drivers can actually initialize themselves to be wake up capable, and I just kind of briefly cover the APIs involved in doing that. So the driver would have to basically tell the, the power management core that it is wake up capable, and this is the interrupt that's actually wake up capable. And you can, you can sometimes you might want to be awake, uh, provide wake ups, and sometimes you might not want to provide wake ups. And so you can set and clear your wake up interrupt. Um, or you can basically, this is like enabling your wake ups and disabling your wake ups. So it's telling the power management core that, that you're going to be wake up capable. And then the IRQ core and the kernel will actually do different things based on whether you're wake up interrupt or not. Um, this, uh, so when you, when you do have a wake-up event in your driver, this uh, PM wake-up system is relatively new in the kernel. It's only been around for, well, relatively new. I guess it's been around for maybe a couple years now. Um, but this is another thing that sometimes drivers aren't, aren't aware of. If they actually want to be wake-up capable, they, when you do get a wake-up event in your interrupt ha handler, you, you want to notify the PM core as well. And then wake-ups can actually be disabled by the driver themselves, or on a per driver, they can be enabled and disabled from user space. Every, every device has a little knob in SysFS there for every device driver. We doing okay so far? Uh, interrupt service routine. So that's the, typically the interrupt handler in the, in the device driver. So that's kind of that's the that's the simple part of power management. That's what we call static power management. So it's system wide, it's just one shot uh, it's static. Um, the system, the entire system, is put in a in a specific state. So now, kind of all the rest of the power management, the kernel is what we call dynamic power management. So we'll go into the different aspects of that as well. So dynamic power management is based on act the activity of the system. So there's kind of two classes of dynamic power management. One is which how to save power when you're actually doing something, and how to save. And then the other one we call idle power management, which is basically how to save power when you're not doing anything, um, or at least when parts of the system are not doing anything. So we're going to kind of cover both of those both of those bits here. So this is uh, these are kind of the the parts of active power management that we're going to cover. So first of all, let's hit OPPs because that's a, uh, a new concept or a, a kind of a key concept. So OPPs, there's lots of different names for this. Um, operating performance points, operating points. Uh, a lot of different chip makers have different names for the same concept. In the kernel, they're called OPPs. 
There's an OPP framework in the kernel to manage these. It's essentially just a, pair, a, a tuple of frequency voltage pairs um, that, the, that the particular device is capable of running. So um, these are described, at least in DT-enabled platforms, these are described in the device tree. They can be dynamically registered also for non-DT platforms. But um, So there, the documentation down there below is kind of um, covers the OPP framework and the kind of various APIs there. But uh, this is, so the basic idea here is to keep track of the, the, the operating points that the system is capable of running at. So CPU Freak and some of these other frameworks actually use these. In fact, we're going to hit CPU Freak here. So CPU Freak is the kernel framework for CPU frequency scaling. Um, it's a little bit uh, misnamed because now it actually does more than frequency f scaling. So that's why I, I put DVFS. So I don't. I realize I didn't actually dis describe what DVFS is. So DVFS is dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. Um, so that's what CPU Freak is does. So it's basically switching, telling your CPU or telling your devices that it's how to switch between the operating points. So most of you are probably familiar with CPU Freak, at least in the fact there's a little icon in your toolbar once in a while telling you it's running at a different frequency. That's a lot of times the most exposure a lot of people have to this. But there's a kernel framework that's doing this. Um, it's CPU Freak has a framework for governors, so there's a set of pluggable go governors that are that you can kind of swap in and swap out. Most of them are really simple, like the there's a performance governor that just basically says use the highest OPP all the time. There's a power save governor that's the opposite, says use the lowest OPP all the time. And then um, the interesting ones are one like on demand, which actually will look at the um, will kind of calculate its own heuristics and look at the load. Um, and do some predictions based on load, and as well as a little bit of a uh, little bit of black magic in those governors to, to figure out the frequency or figure out what frequency to run at. And then um, there's another governor that's actually not upstream, but it's widely used because it's used in Android, and it's called Interactive. Um, it's a lot like one demand. Is it, uh, it's a lot like on demand in that it looks at the load average. It looks at various heuristics, but it's got a key difference in that it actually will take certain types of events, namely input events or touchscreen events, and immediately boost the frequency to the highest frequency so that as soon as you start touching your device or interacting with the device, it's not going to have latency. Um, so on demand is, is notoriously bad for that because after your device has been idle for a while in your pocket or screen off or something, the load is down. It takes a little while for that governor to ramp up and decide that it should run at a higher frequency. And so Interactive actually kind of has a few, t a few hacks um, to look at a few specific uh, input type events and really ramp up quickly so that the user experiences for interactive devices is, uh, is actually more pleasant. So that's not been, there hasn't really been much efforts to upstream that. And it's partly because the CPU freak governors are uh, right now are a, a domain of, uh, that are kind of falling into this, uh, some scheduler work that I'll talk about in a little bit. Okay, so underlying CPU Freak, some, this is just a few more of the frameworks. This is what is a common CPU Freak driver would actually use to scale frequency. So there's a clock framework. Um, Mike will be talking about the clock framework a little bit later this week. Um, a little bit about it anyway, but the the basic idea is there's a, there's, our, there's a kernel framework for getting clocks and setting clock frequencies, finding out what the clocks are currently running at and changing them and so on. So the CPU Freak driver is using that on most platforms. Um, some platforms actually have firmware that does this, and so you make firmware calls or you rely on ACPI or something like that to do this. But on a lot of ARM platforms that I'm familiar with, the kernel actually manages all those clocks. And so um, the CPU Freak driver is doing that. Similar for voltage scaling, there's a regulator framework that actually handles this. So, um, so this example driver that I give down there, the CPU Freak DT driver, it actually uses both. It, it gets reads OPPs from the device tree, and then it uses the clock framework and the voltage framework to actually change the, the frequencies. And so you can see kind of how to plug in. Um, and a lot of platforms, once you define your OPPs in your, if you already have support for the clock framework and the regulator framework in your, on your platform, all you got to do is add your operating points to the device tree, and you can use this driver, and you get frequency scaling you know, for free, we'll say. 
So that's so frequent DVFS, so frequency and voltage scaling, is kind of the main the main part of of active um, power management. So now let's hit idle power management because this is where most of the work, most of the interesting work actually in is happening because there's a lot of ways to, the hardware is evolving in this area, and so the kernels had to evolve as well. So one thing to notice from here, um, looking at the big picture here, is there's actually different frameworks for managing idle in CPUs than there is from managing idle in devices. And this is kind of interesting. It's more of a, you know, Linux's evolution and not intelligent design problem because we, we had frameworks for idling CPUs before the hardware really gave us the capability or we had the need for it in the kernel to manage idle devices. So the idle device support is a much more recent evolution in the kernel, whereas we've had idle CPU support for a long time. And so that's kind of why they evolved differently. Um, I'll talk about some efforts to kind of merge these a little bit later as well. So let's hit idle CPUs first. So the kernel framework for this is called very creatively CPU idle. Um, and so it's basically managing the, the idle state. So a lot of some platforms, x86 platforms, have ACPI that actually manage all this for you. The concept of the idle states is in, in ACPI is called C states, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, on ARM systems and many other systems that don't have ACPI, the kernel actually has to manage those states uh, themselves. And so there's CPU idle framework, there's CPU idle drivers that do that. So, but the basic idea is that idle states in a CPU have depth, and so the deeper the idle state, the, the more power is savings, but also the longer it actually takes you to wake up from idle. So the idea is that you want to hit the deepest idle state you can, but you also don't want to pay a latency penalty. If you know you have upcoming activity, you don't want to hit something too deep of an idle state when it's going to take you too long to wake up. So the idea of CPU idle drivers, just like CPU Freak, the, the framework has governors that you can plug into that to make, make smarter decisions and look at what's happening in the system and make decisions about how deep of an idle state you want to actually hit. So um, here again, there's some device tree uh, snippets that show how you could describe these idle states. You basically give them a name and you have to know a little bit about the hardware, like how long it actually takes the hardware to enter and exit these states and how long you need to actually stay in that state before you want to, before it's kind of a break even point. Because if you actually spend most of your, if you spend a lot of energy getting in and out of these idle states and you're doing it too often, you actually could waste more energy than actually hitting them. So that you kind of, hopefully you have, uh, you have good enough knowledge of your hardware to get this, these types of numbers to take advantage of the, the framework. Um, so there's, there's a lot of legacy for this, there's platform specific drivers, but now we can actually describe all this stuff in device tree as well. And so there's some generic, um, there's some generic drivers that actually, if you, def if you describe all this in the device tree, you kind of get a CPU idle working pretty easily. Down at the bottom there, there's documentation for the ARM specific uh, way of defining idle states in the kernel, uh, at least de defining them in the device tree. Yeah. You you kind of you have to, you order them by depth essentially. There's kind of a uh, the, the index essentially determines the uh, so by kind of by that's one limitation of this framework is you you have to kind of order them so that the, the the kernel will walk through them in order. So the the yeah go ahead. Um, well, in, in ACPI platforms, this stuff just comes from ACPI. On ARM-based platforms, you'll see you'll see the entries in the device tree for the different types of ARM process ARM-based processors. Not all of them actually have them yet, but um, most of them do. Some still have their legacy legacy uh, um, CPU idle drivers, and so they just each each driver actually just has a hard coded table in the driver itself. Um, but newer platforms all have this in the device tree. For ACPI setup, there's really nothing to do. You, as long as the CPU idle framework is enabled, you kind of get this. For it. 
So I guess I kind of I described all this. Before. Well, no, not quite. So this, this describes kind of how the CPU idle governors work. So there's one governor that seems to be the most common one used. It's called menu. Um, and it essentially is, uh, is, is basically looking for kind of three main areas how it's using to, break, to, to, to make its decision. So it's looking for a break-even point based on the enter and exit times. Um, so it's looking at some of the predictable events in the system. So you can look at the timer wheel, for, for example, and you know when the next timer is going to happen. Um, and so that, that at least is one thing you know that's coming in the future. So you don't want to hit an idle state that's going to take you longer to get in and out of than the next timer is going to happen. So that's an easy one to look at. Um, it also, the kernel also has this QoS framework where you can set uh, latency requirements that will also, the CPU idle governor will also look at. It'll look up the, the QoS framework and compare it to the residency times of the idle states. And so it won't pick an idle state that's longer than any sort of latency request. And there's this number three um, that's called a performance impact. So there's this general um, kind of black magic heuristic in there that it basically looks at the load. And so it's, uh, it will kind of tend to favor shallower idle states if, it's, if the load is heavy. So even if you have a heavy load and suddenly you have kind of a, uh, you don't have any timers happening, you kind of have a, a little bit of idle time, it won't immediately go to the deeper idle states. The, the load will kind of uh, shift the heuristics to kind of favor shallow states for a little, little while, assuming there's a little bit of bursty load. And this, I mean, it's purely black magic. It was, it was tuned for a few use cases and stuff, and so it's, uh, it's, not, it's not really, I mean, it's, it's commonly used. It's in the kernel. It's in the mainline driver. It's in this governor that everybody uses, but it's not... Um, it's not highly sophisticated uh, uh, algorithm for the for determining this load, but it tends to work for for most use cases. So people, I guess, are happy enough with it most of the time. Um, when you're getting to when you're getting into small embedded systems, there are a lot of people tinker with these governors um, or write different gov write custom governors. But for the general purpose, um, uh, it's, most people seem to be happy with it. I guess. Um, so some of the limitations of CPU idle, um, it does handle SMP systems okay, uh, a little bit. Um, it's not very, it's not at all aware of multi clusters. So when you have mo more than one uh, cluster in the system, the the one cluster, the CPUs in one cluster have no idea what the other CPUs in their own cluster or the other clusters are doing. So when you when you want to hit even deeper states, when you can do not only CPU low power states and CPU, but then you can allow the whole cluster to hit a low power idle state, um, it's getting harder to manage that in CPU idle because there's just no awareness of the other CPUs. Um, so that's some of the area that uh, that's being worked on as well. I'll get to that kind of towards the end with um, kind of work in progress stuff that we're looking at. Yeah. Not really, no. Not really, not, not this particular QoS. This particular QoS is basically a system-wide constraint um, geared towards CPU idle. There is, there is a, well, I'll get to that in a little bit. There is a, a little bit more fine-grained QoS um, available, but I don't, think it, I don't think it's being tied, it's not being used directly in the scheduling decisions. At least not that I know of at this point. Yeah. I'm not sure I follow the question. Yeah. So yeah. So idling in device drivers in general is in an area that's really not covered well, and we'll get to that in just a second when we talk about the device device idle management. So it's a uh, it's an area where there's a lot of active work now because most most hardware didn't actually give you that much control over how to whether you whether you actually saved any power and when specific devices are idle. But more and more SOCs actually have that control in hardware, and so the kernel now we can manage that better. So one other part of kind of idle CPUs is uh, this tickless idle. Um, so this is. A lot of folks are familiar with this. is pretty This is pretty standard now. It's been around in the kernel for a long time. But the basic idea is that the, the kernel has a periodic tick, uh, 
And if there's no work to do, if, you're, if you know you're going to be idle for a long period of time by looking at your timers and so on, um, there's, no, there's no reason to actually continue your periodic tick. So you can shut your periodic tick down as well and just program the timer to fire when the next, you look at your timer wheel and see when your next event is going to be. Why not just program the next tick to fire then instead of keep happening the periodic tick? Um, because waking up a CPU to do nothing except reprogram the timer is really wasteful, especially when you have um, CPUs, you know, systems where there's some big CPUs and some little CPUs. Waking up, especially big CPUs that are hogging a lot of power just to program timers is really wasteful. So yeah, that's, the analogy is doing what a lot of us do in the morning, right? Waking up just to shut the alarm off and going back to sleep. That, that's, that's what we want to avoid, uh, avoid in the kernel. So that's um, idle CPUs. Now let's talk about idle devices because this is, uh, this is an area that I work on quite a bit. Um, and this is where there's not, that much, uh, there's not that much coverage in the kernel because a lot of people aren't working on hardware that actually can do this. Um, so Runtime PM is the kernel framework that actually manages idle devices. And this is kind of in contrast to um, system-wide suspend or system PM. Runtime PM is on a per device basis, which so if you if you're not familiar with it, you can think of it a little bit like suspend resume, but suspend resume on a per device basis. So individual devices can essentially go in and out of suspend on their own, um, and runtime PM is the framework that manages that. So it's yeah, so it's on a per device, um, and the driver itself is the one who actually controls whether or not this actually happens. So the device driver author and the device driver that knows what's happening in the hardware is the right place to know whether the, the hardware is actually busy, right? Because user space has requested a transfer or it's doing some copy or it's actually interacting with the driver. The driver knows that because it's busy. And so the driver actually signals, um, what, you know, its activity to the power management core so that it can be managed that way. And all the devices are treated completely independently. Um, and so no one device can actually inherently prevent other devices from hitting their low power states. So, and this is completely independent of user space. So when runtime, when runtime power management is happening, it's based on activity in the system. So it, there's no user space freezing or anything going on. It's just that if your user space thread stops interacting with your device driver, suddenly your device driver knows that it can actually go idle and manage it that way. So once again, we see our friend uh, Dev PM Ops. So Runtime PM is implemented, but just by adding a few more uh, function pointers to Dev PM Ops. And so I just kind of list those down there. We'll get into how they're used here just in a second, maybe in the next slide. Um, yeah, so, so kind of the basics of the Runtime PM API. This is what the driver would use. So when there's a when user space is interacting with the driver and the driver needs to touch the hardware or interact with the hardware for some for some reason, it uses this PM runtime get API. So it's basically I'm about to use my hardware, so I call the runtime get, and when I'm done messing with my hardware or my transactions are done or there's nothing else going on, then I do PM runtime put. And it's essentially like a, like a lot of kernel APIs. It's use count based uh, gets and puts. Um, so some, some le the legacy way of doing this is using the clock framework. Uh, a lot of embedded um, kernels and vendor kernels were actually using the clock framework essentially to, to do clock gating on devices. Um, but Runtime PM is a bit more generic and has a, has a few more features that can be, that are actually quite useful for device idle management. So this is one of the areas that's extremely well documented in the kernel. Um, so this documentation there is, is very thorough. Um, and so this is one of the one of the really good examples. Uh, so Raphael um, Wysocki and Alan Stern, who are the maintainers of the PM core, have been quite thorough about keeping this up to date as well. So device drivers actually also have callbacks. So when you do a PM runtime git, for example, you're saying that you're about to about to use the hardware. When the PM core actually is going to finally go and enable your hardware or enable your clocks or whatever it has to do to power on your, your device, you'll get a callback. Um, so you'll get a runtime suspend callback that basically says uh, your, so the, the, the last caller in the device driver that says, okay, I'm finally done with using this device, uh, 
just before the power cycle, your driver will actually get a callback so you can do stuff like save context or actually do anything, any driver specific stuff you might need to do. So, you know, yet, a, yet another set of callbacks that device drivers have to know about. Um, but in these cases, they're relatively simple. Essentially, you get a callback before you're about to be powered off, and you get a callback right after you've been powered on. So if you need to re save or restore context or things like that. A lot of drive, uh, many device drivers don't have to do anything here. Um, but if you, if you do have context or you, you're, the device memory itself is in an area, if it's going to be power gated, it's going to lose context, well then you have to start worrying about things like that. So another interesting feature of runtime PM is this idea of auto suspend. Um, it's basically deferred suspend, so you can say I'm done with, I'm done using this device, but don't actually power gate it until maybe 100, 200 microseconds. So it allows you to deal with kind of latency type things if you have bursty activity um, and you know that might, you, might be, you might be getting something in the near term but you're not sure, you can essentially say I'm done with the device but I don't really want you to suspend immediately, take a little bit of time and it's a kind of a configurable timeout. And that timeout can be configured by the device driver, it can actually be configured from user space as well on a per device basis. So. Um, for example, one of the examples that uses this that I worked on is the I squared C driver. So the I squared C driver is, is, can be quite bursty and you don't really know how many I squared C users are on there. So, but you can actually power gate the I squared C bus between I squared C transfers. Um, and that actually is a pretty common thing to do. But if you're having lots of bursty I squared C transactions, you might not want to deal with the penalty of that. So you, you might enable this auto suspend feature. So it kind of it's more it kind of stays powered on as long as there's kind of bursty activity. And then you could actually from user space uh, tinker with that knob um, to deal with the adjust latency. And that auto suspend um, is per again it's per device just like all these other things. So you can you can control that on per device basis. It's under the sysfs. Um, power directory for all the for any device. So another area in uh, in PM uh, device specific PM is this PM domains. Um, so here we have the this diagram again that I brought up, and so all the kind of blue boxes are meant to represent power islands or power domains. So essentially, separate voltage rails on a chip that can be basically power gated independently. So you can see on a, on a SOC like this, this is kind of a, just a, a mock-up SOC, but there, this, is a, this is actually simple compared to a lot of SOCs out there today. But you can see there's a lot of different ways to group devices into power islands. So if only some parts of this chip are actually busy, the rest of them can actually be completely cut off, you know, zero volts. Um, and so you can also see in this drawing that these power islands can be nested. Um, and that's pretty common you have, especially in I.O. devices. So, um, and of course, as with everything, power gating actually has latency implications because it takes these external voltage regulators time to ramp up when you're going to actually turn a, turn a, uh, a set of, uh, turn a power rail on. And so you don't want to actually power gate, again, just like CPU idle, you don't want to actually power gate your power island if you're going to be, if you have latency constraints and you can't deal with the penalty, the, the time it might take you to power up. So um, the kernel frameworks have to deal with that just like they do with CPU idle and CPU freak. So in Linux, this, this is handled with, there's a generic concept in the driver model called PM domains, which essentially is a, a way to arbitrarily group a set of devices together and kind of group its callbacks. Um, and so that's what's used in the kernel to implement this. Um, and there's a struct dev PM domain that actually kind of models this. And you can see that struct dev PM domain itself, it's just another container for dev PM ops as well as a, a handful of other things. So in the kernel, though, we, we kind of have an, a, another abstraction called GenPD, Generic PM Domains. So this is kind of a layer just above the, the driver model um, way of grouping devices. This is called GenPD. I'm actually one of the co-maintainers of this particular part of the PM core. Um, and this is, this is also, this is only probably a year and a half, maybe two years old. Um, but it is entirely based on runtime PM, as you might expect. And so it's, it's just like another layer. So if you have a whole bunch of devices and they're all doing runtime PM, 
um, together, when, when they're all runtime idle, when they're all runtime suspended, you know that you can actually power gate the power to the, the domain itself that they're all contained in. So you group devices that are sharing a power rail together, and when they're all idle, then you know you can power gate the domain. So GenPD has a way of, um, well, when you assign a device to a GenPD, it essentially starts keeping track of the, the, the runtime PM transitions of all those devices. And so when the last, when the last guy is um, done, it can power gate the domain. And when the first device is, is runtime resumed, it has to power on the domain. So once again, another structure full of function pointers um, that you can implement for your, for, for your power domain. And just like the other frameworks, it has this concept of governors that you can plug in. So on a per domain basis, you can have a governor that's looking at um, QoS types constraints or looking at other things that you know about your hardware. And you can, you can decide whether or not you actually want to power gate. Right? So even if you can power gate the domain, you don't have to. Your governor can say, actually, I, I don't want to power gate it because I have a latency constraint. So all my devices are idle, but I'm not, I'm not quite ready to actually power gate. So you have kind of flexibility on a lot of levels here with GenPD. So again, device tree, um, you can describe these power domains in the device tree. Um, each, type of, each type of power domain is gonna have its own driver because there's different ways to actually, you know, it's hardware specific how you actually change the voltage and shut down power domains and so on. But there's a generic binding in the kernel um, that actually allows you to define that. And then you write a, you write a driver that's going to match the specific compatible string. And then below there shows how you'd actually hook up a device. So you have, if you have a device in the, in the device tree and you want to say that it's, it's part of a particular power domain, you, there's a power domain's property that you use to point to the, the, the gen PD that it's a part of. So the device tree actually allows you to describe this whole hierarchy, which devices are in which domains, and which domains are in other domains, and you can do all that in the device tree. So that's all documented there in the device tree bindings. So I, I think for this audience, I'm probably going into just enough detail to make you curious, but not enough detail to actually make it that interesting. So I apologize for that, but that's kind of the, the nature of doing a big uh, overview talk like this. So that's why I link to all these documentation pieces if you want to go into the, the, the gritty detail. Hopefully this will make you curious to, to dig deeper. So back on this QoS topic. So for the CPU idle framework, there's, a, there's some QoS constraints that are meant to be system-wide. Um, so you want to, you wanna, and, and that kind of comes from the fact that that's all the kernel actually had control of before. Um, and so this particular one on top there, it's called, I don't know why it's called CPU DMA latency because it really only has to do with, it's only used in the kernel for CPUs, but anyway. Um, so CPU idle uses this particular one to decide its idle state. But now we also have this per device QoS. So this, in runtime PM, this is actually really useful because if you're gonna decide whether to power gate a power domain or idle a device, you, you want to be able to look if anybody, any particular device or subsystem is actually registered a QoS constraint. So you can actually do things like, um, um, it allows other drivers or other parts of the system to say, I have a latency constraint for, for, for a little while anyway, I've got a latency constraint, so I don't want these three devices to ever be power gated for a little while. Um, and allows you to do things like that. So it doesn't affect the entire system. Today, uh, before per device, you could do something like that, but you essentially affect all the devices in the system from ever hitting their low power states. With per device, you can actually do it on a subset of devices or subset of domains. So it's, again, the hardware lets us be this granular now and we, the kernel has control over it, so we need, the, the kernel now has a way to let us do that. Um, so that's, what we, it's called per device PMQOS. Um, and uh, so that's, that can be used, to, and now it's used in the, the most obvious place now is the Gen PD governors can actually use that. There's no in-tree um, examples of very complicated governors for Gen PD, um, but there's a several, several vendors are using that in their in trees to, to do their own things. But uh, the, the simple governor there is basically you can, set, you can set a flag that says, please don't ever gate my power domain. 
Um, that's kind of useful for debugging. If you're writing a device driver and you haven't yet figured out how to save and restore context for that device, um, you can set this and basically you know you'll never get, you never get power gated and so you'll never lose context. Um, yeah, so there's just there's a couple there's a couple types of different types of latency that are there that can be used. Um, this is actually a, this is actually a, a, an area of of active development now, but uh, I haven't seen that many submissions upstream for governors. But like the other frameworks, it actually has a pluggable way to do this. Yeah, you have a question. Yeah, so there are the, there's a sysfs interface for runtime PM that actually you can list. Uh, in fact, PowerTop uses this uses that interface because in in PowerTop, in, at least in PowerTop two, one of the tabs all the way to the right, it, it gives you kind of hints about devices and it'll tell you maybe that runtime PM isn't enabled for your device. Um, but yeah, there's a whole set of sysfs interfaces that tell you the the runtime status of all the devices. It also tells you, uh, there's a bunch of st statistics in there, how long it's been active, how long it's been suspended, uh, how many transitions it's made, and stuff like that. And so PowerTop, there's tools that actually like PowerTop that will read all that out. So similarly for, so that's for per device. For Gen PD, there's also a, a way to do a list of all the power domains and what their current status is, and similarly their transitions and so on. Yeah, everything's in sysfsing. So that's pretty much it for the for the main kernel frameworks. I just wanted to hit on a, a couple areas that are kind of work in progress, things that are happening right now, things that are under development, at least that I know of, that are going on, that are being worked on. Um, so in runtime PM and Gen PD, um, this is an area that I'm working on. So like I mentioned before, this we're handling in the we're handling CPU idle CPUs that are idle and I.O. devices that are idle completely differently. Um, and so there's some effort. I presented uh, at Linux Plumbers in Seattle uh, a month or so ago. I presented, a, I kind of made a pitch that we need to start looking at unifying um, the way we handle CPUs and how, how we handle I.O. devices. And so the basic idea is kind of move away from the CPU idle model and use runtime PM. Because conceptually, at least from a hardware level, CPUs are just devices hanging off a bus just like the I.O. devices are. Um, so, and we can use the, the frameworks. And the nice thing about this is it can handle, a runtime PM is actually designed from the beginning to handle this hierarchy and nesting. And like I mentioned in CPU idle, the, some of the limitations of CPU idle is it's not doing very good with SMP and it's not doing good with multi-cluster. It, it, it doesn't know about these hierarchy of devices and, and runtime PM with Gen PD is actually designed exactly for that. So these are some things we're exploring actually is switching to use runtime PM for CPUs, even model some of the other hardware that's connected to a CPU that would lose context when a CPU loses context, like the interrupt controllers and floating point units and sometimes the PMU, like the power um, or the performance counters and things like that. Those all lose context as well when a CPU gets power gated and the kernel doesn't do a good job of dealing with that right now. Um, so yeah, so then again, so that's for CPUs, and then clusters, of course, are a natural fit for Gen PD, right? A cluster is a collection of devices. Right? So using a Gen PD to actually model a cluster, which might include CPUs, but it might also include a shared cache, for example, that all the CPUs in the cluster are sharing, and that cache can lose context as well. So you want to be able to model that. <coughs> So finally, another area that's actually under active development right now is this whole idea of energy-aware scheduling. So basically, you know, the idea is to make the scheduler a little bit more energy-aware and to be aware of the different types of CPUs in the system. So this is this is being um, this is useful not just for um, uh, SMP systems, but ARM has been pushing on this for their big little architecture where you can have a cluster of big CPUs in terms of performance, but also in terms of power, as well as little CPUs. So the, the main work behind EAS is essentially just trying to teach the scheduler how to better, better deal with CPUs that have different types of capabilities. And uh, things like maybe steering more tasks to the small CPUs um, and, and figuring out when a task really needs to be performant and move it over to the big CPUs.
So this, this has obvious advantages for, of course, big little systems, but there's also, there's interest in it just from SMP systems as well, just for the, having a little more flexibility with the scheduler to, to kind of uh, determine where to place CPUs. And the other area that's really interesting in this is, so I mentioned in both CPU idle and CPU freak, they each, they each have their own governors and they each have some interesting heuristics and black magic involved. And they're looking at load and they're looking at um, doing their own calculations. But the scheduler already knows all this stuff. The scheduler is keeping its own set of pretty detailed statistics about load. And now um, the scheduler also has a bunch of information about individual tasks and how a task has behaved in the past and its kind of recent history. And so the idea is to kind of move away from these CPU idle and CPU freak governors and actually move more towards using data that the scheduler already has and possibly even using the scheduler decisions directly to influence the idle and the CPU freak. And so that's an area of, that's really under active work right now. There's a lot of traffic on the, on the, the list around stuff. There's, there's several parts of it that have already been merged, um, more kind of cleanup and reorganization stuff to make this stuff possible. Um, and there's and there's uh, active development and this stuff. I mean, this stuff is yeah really being actively discussed, you know, as we speak. So, so that's another kind of in progress area there. So I think that's that's everything. Any more thoughts or questions or yeah. Yeah. Not, not on the active side, yeah. Active yeah. Side, yeah. Right. So, yeah, that, I guess well, there, there, I, I hinted at it, I think, in one slide, but I forgot to mention it. On the active side, similar, we have CPU freak for uh, managing the, op the operating points of CPUs. There's another framework called dev freak that allows you to, if you have devices that actually can be scaled uh, independently, that uh, I/O devices that have their own frequencies and voltages, like GPUs, for example, or DSPs or things like that that might have multiple operating points, there's a kernel framework that actually can deal with that as well. But it, yeah, that's, it's very much modeled on, dev, on CPU freak, but it's, much, it's a little bit simplified and it's aimed towards devices. Yeah. Yeah, those things are typically handled by the CPU freak governor. And there's also a concept of a, of a CPU freak policy. So, for example, you might have a range of OPPs. You might have a range of operating points, and uh, you can remove them dynamically. So this, this might be a case, for example, in a thermal situation where you have a range of OPPs, but if you run at the top one for too long, uh, you're going to overheat. So sometimes you'll have a thermal situation that'll kick in and essentially remove a, the top, the, the highest performing operating point for a little while or something until you cool down and then it'll add it back and allow it in the system. So there's ways of doing that with the combination of governor and thermal drivers and things like that. Yes? <clears throat> I don't know. I don't work on laptops much, so I, I don't. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing about laptops, especially x86 laptops, is a lot of this stuff. In fact, almost the entire right-hand side of the slide is all done in firmware, in ACPI. So the kernel really doesn't do much. The kernel manages some of the initial decisions whether to do whether to switch states or not. But essentially, the kernel for x86, it doesn't do anything for idle devices at all. Um, firmware does all that. Um, and the same with idle CPUs. You can do a little bit with the governor, but then you can, t you can, ask, you can tell the hardware, I want to hit this idle state. But whether, the, whether or not the firmware actually does that or not, you have no idea. <laughs> 
Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. In some cases, some cases you have kernels that just don't even turn on these features. Period. Right. And that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have a feeling it's because distros maybe are sometimes shy about turning on some of these features because, especially in x86, if you have such a broad range of hardware and a BIOSes and firmware and stuff, you just don't know if it's going to work on various firmware. So I think there's maybe a, yeah, it's too bad. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's that's a big part of what's happening in EAS right now. And so you can do it with with just like nice or something with regular priorities, and you can also do it with um, with C groups or something. You can put a, a whole class of tasks in a C group and pin that class of task to a certain set of CPUs or things like that. But the idea is you 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 can do a lot of that stuff manually. The idea behind EAS is not just doing that, letting you giving you the ability to do that. <clears throat> the idea behind EAS is making a scheduler actually be able to notice when a task is kind of a, a little task, we'll say, and don't let it migrate, and also be able to notice quickly when something is ramping up to move it. Um, so yeah, the, the, the ability to do both, you want to be able to override things if you're the administrator and you know, but you also want the schedulers to be smart and do, you know, do the right thing by default. And, Yes. Yeah, I think again that's the distro things. I think distros just don't do as Linux distros don't aren't able to do as much testing for this type of power management or optimization. And there's, there's probably room. There's a lot of room for improvement. Clearly. And it's just not that, I mean, for me, I, at least for me, I work on small devices, you know, phones and embedded stuff. So I haven't spent that much time with laptops, but I think it's just a matter of interest. Uh, there's a lot of room for work there, but nobody seems like, you know, the, 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 the wall socket is a little too close to be able to plug in. You, you can plug in quickly, so if you don't care, I, I don't know why it's not that actively worked on. Okay, I think I'm out of time, or, or even past time. All right, thank you very much.